Thank you very much. I have a discovery this morning. I think you have a new career. You have a good voice. <laughs> you announced? No, because they are true. While we're all climate warriors here, to be able to communicate the message is half the battle won. And I think that's one of my advantages, being a communicator since I was a child. But I see that uh, our executive director, uh, are you deputy? Executive director uh, is not just a lawyer, but he actually communicates well. So I think you should use him more in the Climate Change Commission. And in uh, during times when well, we need to uh, inspire and uh, encourage our local governments and our state universities and colleges. I think you should make what's his first name, Attorney Cuenca, speak more often, right? And let's also learn to communicate our messages in the various languages of our country. The country has great ethnicity, diverse indigenous peoples, groups, and languages. Who in this room is able to tell me? How many ethno-linguistic groups we have in the Philippines? If no one can, he already failed my test. Where's my staff? How many do we have? More than 100. How 80 lang yata. Victoria, may magna ko laude. How many? No, not participants. Okay, no one's able to get me. So we just have. I'm just trying to catch your attention this morning, right? So. We just have over a hundred ethno-linguistic groups and we have various rituals, indigenous culture, practices. Can I have a copy of my Karsuk book, which we did with the six Cordillera SUCs? Get a copy. So that all our different representatives from various LDCs is able to understand how we are not just documenting and researching, but we also uh, document and inspire our not just local government units but also state universities and colleges to know their indigenous agricultural and environmental practices because not only scientists and experts and lawmakers know everything we have to learn from the ground from the indigenous people from our rural women from those who actually live by the sea and live in the mountains. So that's how I open my message today. That's not yet my message. <laughs> I would like to thank all of you for having me here. I apologize for being a bit late. Um, I wake up very early in the morning and start my work at 6 a.m. There's just too much work and uh, I apologize. It's never an excuse to be late. It's my fault. I should have been 30 minutes earlier but uh, so much work in the Senate, it's in the other side of town. I would like to greet uh, my favorite commission, a commission which I created by law in 2007, born out of a dream, figuratively and literally speaking. A dream where the government would have a dedicated entity towards mitigating and adapting to climate change. Because before it was relegated, as you know, to the Department of Environment, to the Department of Agriculture, and people would actually confuse climate change with all other issues. It was a battle difficult to wage, even to my colleagues in my second term in 2007, when I single-handedly also created the Senate Committee on climate change and the oversight committee on climate change and at the same time enacting by law the commission on climate change which is now known as CCCOM, climate change commission and it's a mandatory law creating the people's survival fund you know we in the philippines were ahead of the green climate fund because we had the psf even before the gsf gcf the gcf is being um, activated, how long has it been, five years? It just became after 2010, maybe 2010. The PSF came into being in 2007 when I wrote the bill. However, there was one or two senators, climate deniers like Trump, uh, who did not believe in climate change mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance and excised it for my bill. They were proven to be wrong and one step 
two steps back, one step back, two steps forward, after the Climate Change Act was enacted, creating the CCCOM, we filed with the Senate President then the PSF. It was also enacted by law. So, boo, those who excised because they said climate finance is not important. A senator even said that climate change does not exist. Another senator even said that climate change should just be relegated under the DNR. Right, Victoria, you know that, no? But never mind the negativity. Now we'd like to look at the positive action. And I'm glad that we have the Senate Committee on Finance, and the Senate Committee on Climate Change shepherding, helping the newly created Climate Change Commission where there are three commissioners and uh, young and not so young uh, staff, secretariat, I don't think Attorney Cuenta is very young. So there are, uh, uh, it's populated by new, not so new, recycled, whichever. And I understand the fact that the commission needs shepherding. And that's the reason why after creating them, and I'll go direct to the point, I will help the CCCOM do the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan, which is actually the intent of this hearing, meeting, event today. I'd like, I wish everything was a committee hearing so everything's documented. And so while we in the, the LDCs of developing nations will be assisted by the UNFCC, uh, Albert, I'm glad you're here. I really think that the DNR uh, Climate Office uh, should collaborate with my office more, right? Even if I'm no longer the chair of the Environment Committee in the Senate, but I'm the vice chair in finance and, and climate change. I think Albert and the three commissioners and uh, uh, Attorney Cuenca, who's a good voice, and um, <laughs> Victoria and Joy Goko and, and, and Kabset. So he, we see a convergence of like-minded souls to work together. Since uh, you, uh, the DNR heads the cluster committee, right? And the CABSEC office is, is the one that handles all the clusters. And the secretariat is a CCCOM. So we should all work together. And the Senate oversees everything. And since January, I was assigned in quotation mark by the president to be the de facto chair of the Climate Change Commission because the chair of the commission is no less than the president of the Republic of the Philippines. When I wrote that bill in 2007, I envisioned a president to chair the commission. And guess who was my seatmate? Noi Noi, MR. And Noi asked me, Loren, ano naman yung climate change mo? Bakit naman presidente pa ang pangulo? I said, because it's the greatest humanitarian challenge of our times, and we must make the president a climate warrior to battle climate change. Because I believe the two most important issues of our time, not just in the Philippines, but in the world, are terrorism and climate change. And climate change breeds terrorism because when people are poor, then it could be a breeding gun for terrorists. So these are the two greatest national security threats of the Philippines, and for me, the greatest humanitarian challenge of our time. And so, the president is the chair, but the president, of course, our very hardworking president, is so, so, uh, is so um, busy with all the challenges, as you know, which I don't have to state in this forum. And I, I committed to help the Climate Change Commission in my duty to perform my duty as oversight Committee on Foreign Relations and Climate Change and Finance. So I hope that our commissioners and the Climate Change Secretariat and uh, the Climate Change Office as well of the DNR and the CAPSEC Office uh, having oversight also over the cluster could work together so that we can do our NAP and be a model. Uh, because under the climate change law, we already envisioned as far back as 2007. Because under my law, I mandated the national climate change, we called it action plan, which actually includes disaster risk reduction, loss and damage, mitigation, and adaptation. 
It is up for review. It was enacted in law 2009. It should have been reviewed in 2013. If it was not reviewed, then we will review it now. And so after this meeting today, uh, after your two or three day conference, then you can come back to me. The commissioners are here. Uh, DNR is here, CAPSEC office should report so that whatever learnings, tools, then you can come to the Senate that I can host so that your agencies also don't spend. Let us spend. We'll feed you, we'll house you, we'll keep you in a room until you work, until you come up with results, and we will have the energy policy review, the NDC review, and the NAP. How would you like that? So you'll have to see me every day whether you like it or not. Right? Commissioners, one, two, three. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, I want to hear louder or yes. yes. Okay, good. So, should I still read my speech? Uh, all I'm saying is that this is so important that I'm glad the Philippines is part of this whole scenario and it's being held here. So, I believe that all of us here today know and agree that we are at risk that's no longer to be discussed. That we're all vulnerable to climate change risks. The signs are all around us. In the Philippines, you know very well what happened in 2009, in Ondoy, you know, Yolanda or Hayan in 2013, but even without these cyclones or storms, even by just monsoon rains, like what happened in Cagayan de Oro a few months ago, because they did not faithfully implement RA9003 or the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, no less than Mayor Oscar Moreno admitted to me because of the incessant rains, then they immediately flooded because plastics were found in the waterways. And so we're vulnerable to climate change risks. The signs are all around us. The numbers speak for themselves. It is no longer an issue of taking action, but rather of how much action we need to take. So we see, before we were just talking about policy 15 years ago, even in 1998 when I first enacted the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, it was a time for policy making. But then 10 years hence in 2007, it's taking action. 2017, it's no longer a question of taking action. It's no longer first an issue of knowing, because it's assumed we all know. Awareness is a done deal. It's no longer an issue of taking action, because it's a given that action should have been taken a long time ago. It's an issue of how much action we must take. And so, how much action did your chair of the Finance Committee do? You know what I did? Apart from climate tagging our budget, which the DBM, Department of Budget and Management, is doing, we have identified general and special provisions in our national budget of 3.3 trillion pesos so that each agency, whether you are a state university and college or you are the Department of Agriculture, whether you are the Department of Environment or the Senate of the Philippines, you must follow certain special and general provisions which are, in a way, linked to climate action adaptation. Let me just give you some examples. This is not all. For example, in past years, the GAA, we call it the General Appropriations Act, never had climate provisions until they finally for the first time, a female senator chaired the committee on finance. And suddenly all the men started saying, what is she doing to our budget? Making it not only gender oriented, but also climate adaptive. And so I started putting provisions such as the DILG shall encourage the local government units to establish and maintain an efficient and effective early warning system to enable the individuals and communities threatened by typhoon, flood, tsunami, and other impending hazards to prepare and to act appropriately and in sufficient time to reduce the possibility of harm or loss. This was only uh, indicated in our GAA, perhaps when I vice-chaired the commission or, or the 
the, the Finance Committee a few years ago or only when I became chair two years ago. Again, and it's, uh, I, I hope whoever typed this, okay, it's wrong. It's not early warning, it's early warning. This could be a Freudian slip, so whoever gave me this. So it's a typo error. So I hope in the guide it doesn't say warning, okay? All of it is not warning, okay? Because I can see the note here with my glasses now, it's early warning, it's warning. Not warning. Brian, where are you? <laughs> so, if you could help me with the, our experts, could help me, Sonam, Paul, help us improve our ga'a. And I would encourage, so action one, all countries represented here today in this workshop should encourage their parliaments to make it a green resilient budget, to have general and special provisions in agencies of government that can do climate action. So that you don't have to enact laws individually. You actually do it by putting it in your biggest piece of legislation, which is the national budget. And that's what I did. Correct. No one's saying I'm correct. <laughs> For example, the DSWD, the Department of Social Welfare and Development for the Information of Her Foreigners has the Four Peace Program. The Four Peace is an intervention for the poorest of the poor who are given conditional cash transfer as long as they meet certain conditions like reproductive health and education for their children. Climate was never part of the scenario. And why should it not be? And so I included climate. Conduct of family development sessions. The DSWD in the conduct of family development sessions among conditional cash transfer beneficiaries shall integrate in its program the protection of the environment, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation and mitigation, including the preservation of the indigenous culture of their locality. They said, what is she talking about? You're talking about the four peace and the poorness of the poor and she's talking about DRR and indigenous culture and why not? Who says that only those who are middle class or wealthy should understand the importance of IT culture? Who says that DRR should only be for the academics and the lawmakers? No, in fact, they're the most vulnerable and they're the poorest. They must understand climate action in the vulnerable areas of our country. We, I also put the DSWD shall also conduct capacity building programs to prepare its beneficiaries for the onset of natural hazards and to provide sustainable livelihood opportunities in the implementation of the sustainable livelihood program and they adopted it. The SLP is a program now of the four Ps. The DSWD shall converge with the NCCA, which is a National Commission of Culture and Arts, for the CCT beneficiaries to undergo skills training on traditional arts and crafts under the schools of living tradition when applicable. In fact, it does not say here, where's my staff, I hope you're taking notes, test that should be part of it because I also work together with a technical education skills development authority to teach apart from the usual food processing and dress making indigenous skills of traditional arts under the SLT program. So we have the DSWD and the NCCA and the test staff. So you want me to go further? Uh, under energy efficiency, all national government agencies, local government units, and government-owned and controlled corporations shall embark on energy efficiency measures and adopt the use of energy efficient lighting such as LED lamps in their office buildings, school buildings, hospitals, etc., public parks, and 10% of the service vehicle fleet shall use more energy efficient and environment-friendly alternative fuel vehicles such as electric vehicles, etc., etc. Why is only 10%? No, I, I'm going to amend this in the 2018 budget and make it a bigger chunk. Let's say renewable energy. The Department of Energy shall intensify the development and utilization of renewable and environment-friendly alternative energy sources. I can go on and on. These are actually around 50 general and special provisions which I put into the national budget without my colleagues knowing about it. Would you believe no one even asked me a question about this? It was a non-debated topic, perhaps because no one understood what I put in. But that's bad. People should debate it. In fact, I'm debating in my mind now because these are not the best provisions. Now I see it could be improved. So the number two action here is, please, I will give you a copy 
I'll give it to Victoria, uh, Climate Change Commission. All the climate environment provisions in our GAA make it a test case and make it please an output of this conference. Improve it. Improve it. I'm a perennial learner. Even if I'm smart, I never think I'm the smartest. That's the way to learn. I'm always, I'm like a child. I always want to learn and know more. And I always think the person beside me is better than me. And the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And see, even if I'm proud of my work, I realize it's not the best. So, may I ask the experts, especially from Bhutan uh, and, and from the other countries, vulnerable as well, to give us your inputs on how to improve the CCCOM, the three commissioners, Attorney Cuenca, uh, DNR, uh, Albert, uh, get to work with us. Okay, so improve the special provisions. And if you have anything more, because there will be much more, please submit it to my office at the end of this conference. Because I really want to make sure that our General Appropriations Act is a resilient budget. And what's important is, and Manny knows this, who's the DRR expert, we were able to align our GAA with the SDGs and with the Sendai framework. I don't think there's any national budget in the world that has in its explanatory note of general provision that this budget, apart from having all special climate provisions, will abide by the Sendai framework for action and the SDGs. Now, just recently, I was a speaker in the launch of the NEDA Philippine Development Plan. They are also, they've also somehow immersed or embedded climate action in the PDP. And so I'm supposed to read this long speech. Let me just go through it. It talks about the United States pull out from the Paris Agreement, but never mind that. Uh, one unenlightened individual in the world or in that country uh, cannot dictate uh, cannot dictate climate action in the world. So we just ignore him, right? So what is the silver lining following the announcement two weeks ago of the United States president? We see it in the climate action of their local governments. We see it in industry. We see it in Michael Bloomberg's action. We see it in what Al Gore has done, it continues to do. We see it in what little communities are doing who are going 100% RE. And so it is a reaffirmation issue also by other responsible institutions, academics, business and industry, and heads of state, I mean, um, uh, governors and mayors, and a reaffirmation issued by all the responsible leaders of the world on their commitment to keep fighting against global warming. I, I think it was a good thing that happened. Magkahalataan na, diba? That's Tagalog, uh, meaning what is it in English? Let's see. Uh, it, it's good that it's clear. We see who's for and who's against, who's unenlightened and who is visionary and who cares. Because climate is a gut issue. So we all understand the urgency of taking climate action because for us, this is a matter of survival. I don't even have to convince you about 1.5 degrees, even if some scientists may say it could be difficult to achieve, but who said things were easy. We have to aspire and we have to do it. 1.5 degrees. At this level that we're experiencing now, we've reached the one degree Celsius. We're already experiencing unprecedented extreme weather events, and I don't have to say that. The Kidapawan clash in Mindanao two years ago is an example of how peace and order will be disrupted when there is no climate action, because the administration or the government did not prepare for the drought, did not give water, uh, uh, water sources, did not give pananim, uh, uh, resilient crops did not engage the local community into climate action which was foreseen and did not prepare. There was a big rally, there were a few dead and hurt and, and it was just terrible, which could have been avoided if climate action 
was taken. A study by DARA, commissioned by the Climate Vulnerable Forum, titled Climate Vulnerability Monitor, a guide to the cold calculus of a hot planet, shows that if the world goes business as usual, there will be six million deaths per year by 2030. I think all of us here today hopefully will still be around by then, close to 700,000 of which will be due to climate change. The report further states, and I quote, that a significant share of the global population would be directly affected by inaction on climate change. The global figures mask enormous costs that will, in particular, hit developing countries and above all, the world's poorest groups. LDCs faced an average of more than 7% of foregone GDP in 2010 due to climate change and the carbon economy. Over 90% of mortality assessed in the report occurs in developing countries only, more than 98% in the case of climate change. And of all these losses, it is us, lower and middle income countries that are most exposed. Our losses of income are already extreme, and our development goals, particularly on poverty reduction, will be harder to achieve because of the climate crisis. In just a few hours of rain in 2009 in Ketsana, was Ondoy Ketsana in 2009, in Ondoy, when Metro Manila was totally unprepared and Central Luzon and Region 4A, at least 2% of our GDP was washed away literally and had to use our annual governmental budget and reconstruction and rehabilitation. And when you actually see, if we actually budgeted or earmarked funds for adaptation, sea wall, for example, flood control, for example, even natural buffers against storm surge, like mangrove reforestation or coconut palms triangulation method and other climate action in the vulnerable communities in the rural areas. Of the 30 million hectares of the Philippine archipelago, our archipelago has, what's my figure? Is it 30,000 kilometers? Who has the figure? Who can help me? 30,000, I'm correct. Very good. What is your name? Julius, Julius from? Neda. Magaling talaga Neda. So I'm correct, 30,000 square kilometers. Of the 30 million hectares of the Philippine archipelago, tama ba to 32,000 square kilometers? Get me the exact number. 30, more or less, 1,000 square kilometers, or 822 coastal municipalities. Am I correct? 30,000 square kilometers. We have 1,600 more or less municipalities and 822 or half of it are coastal. These are the most vulnerable populations. These are always the areas hit by storm surge, tsunamis, bagulang, just by rains. And we need to, to work with them to enhance their knowledge because they already, let's not think we're starting from zero. They already have knowledge better than us because they feel it, they know it. But they have to be given the technology, the equipment, the skills, which is what I'm doing with the UP Resilience Institute. Just on a high note again, I'm happy to state that while it is not enacted by law, during the time of former UP President Pascual, we were talking about climate change and I told him that my dream is to have in the state university a UP Climate Change Institute or we renamed it Resilience Center. And now with the UP President Danny Concepcion and Dr. Mahar Lagmai of the Pagasa DOST who did the project NOAA, my dream has come true and my proposed uh, Resilience Institute in 2011 is now operational and we'll be providing them with more assistance in 2000. 18, and I hope that the UNFCC and the Climate Change Commission and the DNR and the CAMSEC office can work with the State University's Resilience Institute, but that's a different meeting altogether. We have very good experts there. And so why am I saying that? Because 
all of the 822, and I'm just talking about the Philippines, what more Bhutan, what more Indonesia, what more Bangladesh, what more the small island states. And so all over the world, more and more nations are mainstreaming climate change adaptation and mitigation in their development policies. I actually would like to learn from all countries represented here and even those not here, what are you doing? So that's assignment number three, which the Climate Change Commission is giving me. You give me, please, the best practices in terms of operational ground-based projects, which we can replicate for the 822 vulnerable municipalities in the Philippines, or even policies. I don't think we have the best minds. I'm sure the other parliaments would have better ones because they have different experiences, anything which could be applicable to us. So there's been a 20-fold increase in the number of climate change laws enacted since 1997, when only 60 such laws were in place. The 2017 update of climate change laws of the World Database shows that at least 1,200 relevant policies are now in place in 164 countries. So while I enacted eight environmental laws in the Philippines, I'd like to know more about the other 60 laws in other countries, which can be enacted here. But honestly, I think we have too many laws. What we need is to really empower our communities to understand the law, these laws for them to actually implement them. Of the ecological solid waste management law, only 25% of our whole population are actually segregating waste at source, recycling, and composting. And believe me, if only all LGUs, where is uh, M MSWC, they're not here, they should have invited, what's his name, Director Ellie. Yeah, you should have Mundita here, BMB, you should have NSWC, because Convergence and I, if they're just uh, working in DNR, they should be here. Because the National Solid Waste Commission is supposed to help local governments do that. And all of us, there's so much plastic in our oceans. That's why I'd like to work more closely with our marine specialist here. Are you a marine scientist? You should be. Yeah, and do the blue carbon project and the coral triangle. So much plastics, and we share our boundaries, our territorial boundaries with other ASEAN nations, but even just ourselves. So you see, we have the laws in place. So the eight environmental laws which I offered, which our uh, announcer here has a good voice announcer mentioned, very neat so the ecological solid waste management law, and I would encourage other countries present here to enact that if you don't have it yet. The Clean Air Act, it could be better implemented. I just go on EDSA with all the traffic and the smoke of the vehicles spew their fumes in our face because I don't like using air conditioner. I like having the fresh air even if it's hot. So, Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. Well, it's a very good law, because we have bright minds in the Senate, in Congress, but they're not implementing it. And just yesterday, in the independence rights in Bulacan, the governor asked me for help, which is the fourth assignment of the Climate Change Commission of the NR. The Marilao uh, Mekawayan River needs help. It's one of the 30 dirtiest rivers in the world. How embarrassing, right? And the governor seems helpless. So this is something at the NR, and I will put the DPWH also in charge for dredging. But we need the experts. I'm not a dredger. I would not, all I know is that the dirt from Caloocan and Valenzuela go downstream to Bulacan. So no matter how much they dredge, the upstream is also the issue. And I'm also going to be full blast with Manila Bay and Laguna de Bay. What was the other one? We're doing three. And the Pasig River, yes, with the CAPSEC office, because that's what the president asked me a year ago. Remember, I warned you, sabi ni Presidente noong July, yung Pasig River, linisin kasi mabaho dun sa likod niya. Magawa niya na, hindi pa. So Pasig River Commission, CAPSEC office, uh, LLDA, whoever's the head now, it's no longer Merrick, and Manila Bay office, whoever's the head now. Yes and the DNR climate office. But the NSW, the National Solid Waste Commission, should always be there. If only the three regions, National Capital Region, Region 3, and 
uh, Region 4A, which comprise the LGUs or local governments around Manila Bay, would cooperate and follow the ecological solid waste management, then we won't have human waste in Manila Bay. Then we won't have plastics and solid waste in Manila Bay. Then it would be swimmable once again. So see, there's so much work to do. That's your, that's your uh, problem because you got me as a speaker. Yeah. What do you expect me to do? Just stand here and, uh, and, and speak a prepared speech and then forget you? No, I'm here because I want to engage with you. I'm here because I expect you to give me climate action. Put your brains together, which you have a lot of, and in three days, that's what I expect, Climate Change Commission. So three, huh? Victoria, you're taking notes. Yeah. Joy Gopo's here. Where's Joy Gopo, our expert? What is Joy? Okay, yes. So, even our budget policies reflect strengthen disaster risk reduction and management efforts. I think we've seen that. We've increased allocation for DRR investments in the national budget. In fact, um, even our NEA, um, cooperatives, there's a pending bill which I support on given, giving um, preparedness funds, resilience funds for our uh, electric cooperatives because they're one of the first who are affected in times of strong winds and, uh, and typhoons. And we previously had the Calamity Fund, and you know that very well. Now it's uh, called the DRR Fund. I will no longer read this very, very long, uh, very good um, speech done by my hardworking terrorized staff. Uh, but I've said more already. Well, the foreigners who are here today might think, you know, Manny knows me already. You know, sometimes I just say things in jest, okay, just to get their attention. I'm not a terror. I'm very nice. And um, my staff are very enlightened and inspired. Oh, another thing. The Green Climate Fund is so important that uh, all countries represented here, including the Philippines, must access it. Is there someone from Bangladesh here? Yeah, you're better than us because you've already accessed it. I think your government has. Is there anyone from Vietnam? You're very good, yes. You know, we even taught Vietnam. Ten years ago, I lectured um, the Deputy Prime Minister and all the ministers in a ballroom five times bigger than this on DRR 101, 2008, in Hanoi, 2007, 8, 9, maybe almost 10 years ago, when Vietnam at the time did not have much information on DRR. Now they're ahead of us. They even access the Green Climate Fund. So Philippines, let's speed up. PSF, spend it. I put 2 billion pesos in the People's Survival Fund. Let's cut the red tape and get the local governments use it. Let's capacitate our GCF funding, just like Bangladesh. Even Mongolia has a very good group I met in Bali. They're very proactive. You know what I see in them? The commonality, passion. That's what we need, and that's what I expect from DNR, CCCOM, uh, CAPSEC, yes, you guys have it. So. This workshop is a great venue to discover opportunities and to work together and share best practices. And whatever your outputs are, as well as the one, two, three, four assignments I gave, please give it to me because you can say that you have been part of the crafting of the General Appropriations Act of the 3.3 trillion budget, perhaps bigger next year, which is an output of the workshop. So. I encourage you to focus on innovation and to use transformation as your ultimate yardstick. Because while it is true that finance can enable ambition, it is equally true, if not more important, to note that ambition can and will enable greater finance flows to our countries. So while we have been bearing the brunt of climate change, even if we did not cause it, while this is what we call the climate injustice of it all, never mind that, we can prove that we are not, we are capable of action, and we will not do 
passivity, apathy, and inaction. And that's what I hate most. And so I thank you for your patience, for listening. I see this gentleman intently listening. In the whole 30 minutes, I've been standing very good. Where are you from? Jordan. Jordan. Very good. Yes, I can see who's listening and who's just, no, all of you are listening. So thank you so much uh, for, for listening. I hope that I could stay longer, but I have so much work in the Senate. In fact, I'm delayed. And um, uh, Victoria and the climate change staff of the commission, uh, Bernice, Noel, Manny, I hope, and uh, CAPSEC, Eve, uh, could make sure that those three points I said can be given at the end of the week when the uh, lecture or the conference is, it, is done. So thank you. We are all in it together, just in one planet we call Earth. And so let's share our knowledge, our best practices, and do urgent climate action. And let it be said that during our watch, while we are gifted with wealth, knowledge, influence, and power, we used it to make our lives better and to make the future generation live in a resilient environment. Thank you. Good morning to all.